to go through the, an unpack the Lent series. We're going through uh, a lot of uh, unpacking of the human sin and the human heart. And, and we believe that this is really important for us to understand truly the gospel, truly what grace means in our life, that we really need to understand just how uh, depraved and complex and broken the human heart is. And so today, I mean, we've been checking, we've been talking about fear, we've been talking about you know, all kinds of uh, brokenness, idols, and, and things like that. But today we're actually going to desires, and today I'm actually going to talk about uh, self-worth. And you just go right away to the first passage. The first passage is going to be the book of James. Um, James, which is one of the uh, the epistles that's written in the New Testament. And right away in James chapter 4 or 6, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now, when I used to read passages like this, um, for a long time, I guess when I was much younger, I, I kind of didn't really understand what it meant to be a humble person. And in fact, I always thought, for a long period of time, I don't know if you've ever gone through this, but I thought that to be a humble person, that meant that you had to be a person of very low self-esteem. That's actually what I thought was the opposite of being prideful. So when I say, okay, well, it's the opposite of being prideful, it's a person that has very low self-esteem, right? And, and that's actually how I translated being a humble person. <laughs> But actually, if you really look at what the Bible is saying, that, that kind of contradicts another passage. Because another passage in the Bible says, we have to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, what, the, what that passage is saying is that you can't love other people until you love yourself properly. So then, this passage that can't possibly mean that we shouldn't love ourselves or have low self-esteem. That being humble should then take on a different meaning or message than merely just saying, oh, maybe you should just look in the mirror and say, the heck with you every single morning, right? <laughs> in fact, a lot of times, I think even prideful people, you, you begin to realize that they are people of very low self-esteem. And so what does it mean to be a humble person? And I actually want to make the argument this morning that to be a humble person, the only way that in which we can be a humble person is if we place our self-worth in the only thing that truly can give us humility. And I'm going to unpack that, or, or humbleness, and I'm going to unpack that as we go along. Um, but let's, let's talk about this, this self-worth for a second, or for a moment. I mean, when we think about self-worth, there's many different things in which we place our self-worth, right? Or which we can place our self-worth. And I remember, you know, for me, years and years ago, one of the things that I placed my self-worth in was being a very loyal friend. I think I, I took a lot of joy and satisfaction in being a very loyal friend. I wanted people to know how loyal of a friend I am. So I was always the first person there for people when they needed me. I was always kind of, uh, or, or my friends, or when they, the last person to kind of leave when trouble would happen. I was always, I wanted to be that person. I wanted to be the first person that gets known to like jump into fights and things like that. Like I wanted to be known as the most loyal friend there is. I wanted people to kind of want to be my friend because they hear about how loyal of a person that I am. And I took a lot of satisfaction in that, but then what eventually started happening was I started realizing that my friends weren't reciprocating my level of loyalty. And I started realizing that and it started bothering me. I couldn't get past that. And as I was realizing that they weren't reciprocating my level of loyalty, I began to start looking down on my friends. I began to start having this very self-righteous attitude. I began to start looking down and thinking, why can't they be more like me and have my level of loyalty? In fact, I didn't just look down on them. I looked down on people. I think eventually I just kind of you know, extracted that into the broader audience of people. And I said, why can't people in general be as loyal as I am? And I started to compare myself. And as I was comparing myself, I began to start feeling very self-righteous and prideful. See, one of the dangers of self-worth and the things that we place our self-worth in is that if we place our self-worth in the wrong things, which are the things of this world, then we start beginning to compare. And either we will get self-righteous and prideful because other people will not meet our standards, or we'll start to have tremendous amount of low self-esteem. Because we'll start to compare ourselves with other people and we'll see that we don't match other people's standards or where other people are at in life. And there's many different things that in which we could place ourselves with. Like one of the most popular ones is um, money, right? Money and success and, and, and things like that. Like I have a friend 
who he, I guess in terms of the guys that I know and friends with, like he's probably the most successful person, right? This guy, like by my age, he already has like three houses and like four car, four luxury cars. And every single time we meet up, he complains. Like every single time he meets up, he complains like, oh man, I don't think I'm gonna buy a house this year. Like, you know, it's just like something, I'm like, what? Like, who are you comparing yourself with? Oprah, like I have no idea. Like, I am, he just complains every single time. Like just complain, 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 complain. You know, and I'm, I'm like, man, I have this huge student dead hanging on my head, and you're complaining you don't get to buy a house this year, right? When you have three. So I was like, I was just amazed at just how even people like him, they compare themselves. They're comparing themselves to other people. And not only is he comparing himself, I'm sure when he when he looks at people who may have less, he's comparing himself and saying, oh, you know, I, they have, I've done a better job than them. Or when he compares himself to people who have more, I'm sure it hurts him as well. And it hurts his self-esteem, hurts his pride, right? And so these kind of things, and, and, and you know the answer to this question. You know what I'm going to say, right? You already know, you know, I'm going to give the, the kind of, Christianese answer and tell you guys, hey, it's about putting your self-worth in being a child of God. But I actually want to talk today and, and kind of make the argument that it's, I think it's more complex than that. It's more complex than simply that. And I'll, I'll explain why. Today I'm actually going to talk about what the most dangerous form of self-worth for a Christian is. What the most dangerous form of self-worth for a Christian is. And we're going to look at the passage in the book of Matthew. Matthew is one of the four Gospels that documents the life and death of Jesus Christ. And in this passage, Jesus Christ is talking to a group of religious leaders that are called Pharisees. Now, Pharisees are religious leaders that have upheld the law, and they've been kind of the good, religious, moralistic people of back then. And this is what it says. It says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. And everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. Now, just to give you some context, what a phylactery is, is that back then, they used to carry um, these leather boxes. And in these leather boxes, they would have Hebrew texts in these leather boxes that would remind them to pray. So this is not a bad thing, right? And, and, and these aren't bad things. Like it's, it's a reminder to pray. And what, but what they would do with these black trees, these reminders to pray, is that they would make them as wide, these boxes as wide as possible, so that people could look at them and see them, and they could kind of show the people that, hey, look, I am praying. Right? I'm, 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 take a look at my box, I'm praying. Right? It's, and, and then they, what the tassels on their garments represented is that they used to have these tassels on their garments that would actually be the reminder of them to obey God's commandments. And once again, they would make these things as long as possible so that people could see that. And once again, it's not bad to pray. I mean, these are good things. You want to pray. You want to obey God's commandments. But the problem was that they were doing it not to obey God, not to please God, but they were doing it to please man. They wanted to show people that they were actually um, doing a good job with all this. And I call this the most dangerous form of self-worth because when we get into this type of thing where we place our self-worth in our identity and how religious and moralistic we are, oftentimes we can trick ourselves and trick other people into believing that we're placing ourselves within being a child of God when we're really not. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty geeky. I like fantasy, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings type stuff. Um, and in Lord of the Rings, I, I used to actually, um, I, once, I don't know why, I used to really enjoy looking up like J.R. Tolkien quotes, um, who was the author of Lord of the Rings. And, and one of the quotes that was really interesting was he actually, you know, in Lord of the Rings, there's, there's two characters, there's Gandalf and then there's Sauron. And Gandalf is, is this wizard who's this kind of righteous guy. And if you ever watch the movies, like you, you know, he's this very, you know, larger than life, righteous guy that you kind of root for. And Sauron is kind of the evil warlord that they're trying to fight against. But this is actually what, what, what J.R. Tolkien writes about Gandalf and Sauron because they're both, uh, Sauron is trying to go after the ring of power. And if Sauron gets it, it's kind of being used for evil and destruction and people are going to be miserable. But this is what, what J.R. Tolkien says about Gandalf and Sauron. 
He says, Gandalf, as a ring lord, would have been far worse than Sauron. That's crazy, right? What? He would have remained righteous but self-righteous. He would have continued to rule and order things for good and the benefits of his subjects according to his wisdom. Now, what, what, what is this talking about? It's such a weird thing. Like, like, I mean, what is this talking about? I mean, you're talking about a guy who's good, right? A guy who wants to do good for people. And you're talking about a warlord who's evil. How can, if Gandalf gets this power, how can he be worse than Sauron? And the point that J.R. Tolkien is trying to make is that, yes, if Gandalf gets this, this, this ring, yeah, there would be good that would happen, but nobody would recognize his inner self-righteousness, including maybe even Gandalf himself. He may never even recognize that, which is why this is the most dangerous form of self-worth. I mean, how many people in here, or how many people do you ever meet, identify themselves as a Pharisee? Like, how often do you ever come across a person and they, they're a Pharisee, right? Like, they say, oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Pharisee. That's something that you probably don't really hear very often because that's something that we don't really recognize in ourselves. But today, I actually want to make the argument that I think that we're closer, many of us Christians, if not all of us, we're closer to Pharisees than we actually think. So, I was, I'm just going to be very honest, um, you know, about one of my big struggles in life and leading up to church planting. I, I really struggle because I grew up in churches. <coughs> where people worship the pastor, right? Like they looked at the pastor as this great leader um, and, and they kind of put him on a pedestal. And those are the church type of churches that I grew up in and saw most of my life, not all of my life, right? Um, well, vast majority of my life. And and for me, you know, I was never really um, that into that. I always kind of, kind of saw through that. I always kind of saw that, you know, this is just the guy who kind of bleeds and cries like the rest of us. This is just the guy who, the Bible doesn't really hold this guy in some type of, you know, He's not a deity or anything, right? But we treat him like he is. And so I was always a little bit bothered by that. But I, I, because this is all I saw growing up, I wondered whether you can actually even have a church where the pastor isn't supposed to be perceived that way. Or you can have a successful church where a pastor isn't put on a pedestal. I always wondered that. And I, always, I was always bothered by that. Um, and eventually I kind of became very cynical. And my cynical nature, my cynical self said, I don't even think that's possible after a while. I said, I, maybe that's just the way people are. Maybe people can't handle a pastor who leads out of brokenness or who isn't put on a pedestal. Like maybe people just can't handle that. And so I, I had this very cynical thought to myself for many, many years. Now, when I went into ministry, I didn't go into ministry. I just want to give you, like... One of my, my, main, my main passion as a pastor is really not to give sermons. It's not to, like these are, I mean, these are things that I, what I speak about, I'm passionate about. But the, you know, my, my passion of why I went into ministry, why I was so drawn into ministry, wasn't necessarily the sermons, wasn't kind of the church politics, it wasn't all that kind of, I just wanted to hear people's stories. Right? That's why I went into ministry. Like that's the reason why I was so passionate and drawn into going into ministry. Now, I am passionate about all these other things, but that was the reason why I was drawn into this. And, and I, as I was drawn into ministry, and, and I just wanted to hear people's stories, one of the things that kind of dawned on me is that I don't think it's fair <clears throat> for me to expect people to let me into their lives if I don't let them into mine. Right? That's one of the things that dawned on me. So, so I... With all my, that, that's the way that I did ministry. That's the way that I believe that, that, that ministry should be done in, in kind of my context or my head. But many of my friends told me that, David, you, you can't be a friends with your congregation members. You always have to kind of put a wall there. Many of my pastor friends, even some of my you know, lay friends, they told me, you can't be one of those guys that, you know, you know, just hanging out with your, with your congregation members on a regular basis. Like you have to kind of put some type of separation and wall there. Many, many people told me that, and for me, that bothered me so much. Because that's not why I wanted to be a pastor. That's not, I, I, wanted, I wanted to let people into my life. I wanted people to see my broken. I wanted people to see my pain as well. So then I remember when, when Janie and I, we first walked into Hope Church um, in Astoria, uh, the first, the first person I ever met in Hope Church was a pastor, Drew, right? And I didn't know that he was a pastor. If you ever met Drew, um, I don't know how to say this. Like, he doesn't look like he's some type of 
special deity. Or whatever. He doesn't look like a guy like you exactly like. He just looks like a, a guy you want to hang out with, right? He looks like a guy you just kind of want to like hang out with, say, you know, like um, give a high five to, and just like you know um, talk about sports with, like just hang out with him. Like he just, he just looks like one of the guys. <laughs> and so and this, the, the first guy that I met was Juin, and as I was there, I actually had a cynical thought in my head because it was a new church plan at the time, and the cynical thought in my head was, how long can this last? Right? Like, how long can this last where you have a pastor who's just so upfront and honest about his brokenness and all, you know, just kind of like looks like one of the guys, doesn't try to. But, you know, so I think I, I continue to struggle with this. And then as I was church planting, you know, I ran into some other hurdles. And one of the things was that I remember as I was kind of, you know, gathering together community and, and kind of building this community. One of the things um, that happened was I actually met with a friend who was looking for a church, and he's a really good friend of mine. And he was looking for a church, and, and he was kind of exploring different churches. And then he said, "Hey, Dave, you know, he was kind of interested in, in helping us and joining with us." And he said, "Hey, Dave, you know, I'm, I'm I'm interested in helping you guys, but let me just pray for it, pray about it, or let me just kind of think about it." And, and he kind of and he went off, and a month later we, we met up, and I remember what he said to me, and and this I appreciate him being honest, but it really, really affected me. I remember what he said was, David, I would love to be a part of this community. I would love to join this church. But he goes, I just know too much about you. And I remember when he said that, I was like, you know, I appreciated the honesty, but I was like, wow, should I change the way I do ministry? Should I change the way I do sermons? Should I change the way I interact with people? Should I put that wall up there so that people could kind of follow me? But this is something that I wrestled through, and I eventually had to take a firm stance on this. And if we could just put up the past, next passage, and this is actually what Jesus Christ says to these Pharisees. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. Again, hypocrites. When we think about this word hypocrite, we think that has nothing to do with me. Right? Just like the word Pharisee or hypocrite, we think that has nothing to do with me. Do you know what the word hypocrite originally stemmed from? It stemmed from a Greek word that simply meant an actor, a stage actor, somebody who's an actor. That's what the word hypocrite originally meant. Now, <laughs> here's the thing. How often can we say as Christians that none of us have ever put on an act? How, how, how for certain we can say as Christians that we never ever put on an act, we never ever put on a mask. And here's the thing that I, that I had to wrestle through, because Russell Joyce, he did a phenomenal sermon one time on Pharisees, right? Phenomenal sermon, like one of the best sermons I've heard on, on this topic. And what he actually said, he, he actually brought up a, a very popular ser uh, survey that was done, in which he, uh, the, the survey questioned uh, the, the kind of the people uh, who are non-Christian, not attending church, why it is or what their perception of Christians are. And number one on the list is that they, people outside, people of this world, say that Christians are hypocrites. They're actors, right? They're actors, they're hypocrites. That's the number one answer that people, non-Christians give or, or people who don't go to church give for as to why they don't want to go to church, why they don't want to get plugged into a church community. Now, taking a look at that, what I began to realize, what began to stir in my heart, is that I want to do church plan to reach the world. I want to do a church so that we can reach the outer, we can reach the world, and we can show that the gospel isn't bad news, it's good news. That, that we've misrepresented this news. That's the thing that I want to show people. Now, here's the thing. If I come up here and present to, my, present to you guys a watered-down version of myself, or if I don't let you into my life, if I put up a wall, yeah, people may follow me. But if I'm authentic to who I am, if I'm genuine about who I am, which includes all of my garbage and my suckiness and all of that filth that stirs up in me, then I could lead people to Christ. Then I could lead people to the one who truly does help their problems. You know, one, one thing that really got me emotional as I was kind of preparing the sermon, um, <laughs> I was thinking about this word hypocrite. And 
I would, this word really bothers me. This word really gets on my nerves. Um, it's one of those things that like, triggers me, <laughs> the word hypocrite. And it makes me angry, you know, and, and I can't like, stand it when people are like blatant hypocrites. It makes me angry. But what's really interesting is when you think about Jesus Christ, you think about the cross, and you think about the, the wonderful life that Jesus Christ lived, that this guy was the Messiah, he was the Savior. And yet, what they did was they, they put him up on that cross and they put a sign above his head to mock him. And the sign they put up above his head said, The King of the Jews! Now, the reason why they were mocking was because they were expecting some type of great warrior to come and free them from Roman captivity. This is what they were kind of expecting. And yet, when they saw it, they were so disappointed. They said, this guy, the king of the Jews, they were kind of mocking him. Because what they were doing when they were placing that sign up there was saying that this guy is not the king of the Jews. He's an actor. He's a hypocrite. This guy is the biggest fraud, actor, and hypocrite that has ever walked this earth. And he has disappointed us all. And what blew my mind, what blew my mind is that so oftentimes we, as Christians, we're, we're, we're trying to kind of be on this level and kind of trying to work our way into being a good Christian and getting self-worth for all of us. The only way in which we are able to do that without comparing ourselves to other people, without being let down or being self-righteous, if we realize that somebody already did the work for us. We realize that somebody already went to that cross for us. And that somebody had to take that punishment on the cross. And when he went up on that cross, to the eyes of man, he became the biggest hypocrite to ever have walked this earth. And he did that for us. You see, Jesus Christ went to the cross. He became the biggest hypocrite. So that now today, we don't have to be. We don't have to be because he's done all the work. If we can just um, close our eyes and bow our heads and we and ask the worship team to come up. And uh, we're going to go into a time of communion. And um, yeah, during this time, um, I actually want to.